Hello, and welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 114. First, the news. I just wanted to say thanks a lot for the patience last week. We had an issue with the latest episode being released on iTunes. Basically, we outgrew FeedBurner, which is the service that tells iTunes that there's a new episode. Uh, We outgrew them by quite a bit, and I guess that's a good thing, but it sure was a pain. Uh, In any case, we're back up and running. We are primarily using our main RSS feed, which comes from Liberated Syndication, which I pay for, but I've just never used it. I never had to use it until now. So thank goodness that I have that service, and a shout out to all the representatives and customer service people over there who helped me bring everything back up in what I thought was going to take weeks in one day. Totally cool. Thank you guys so much. Also, a thank you to John Paul Gomez. I received that shirt about a week and a half ago, and I wore it to the Grand Lodge sessions. And when I rolled into town, I was just wearing that t-shirt and a pair of cargo shorts, and I was checking into the hotel. And the hotel was overrun with Masons, and every single one of them came up to me and had to tell me just how cool that that shirt was. So a big thanks to John Paul and to your wife because she was sending out some emails for you for a while, and I know she's helped you out a lot. It's a family business, and I can't thank you guys enough for what you do for the fraternity and keeping us looking really sharp. We have some cool articles coming up on the Midnight Freemasons as well as in the Working Tools magazine. If you haven't subscribed to the Working Tools yet, please do. It is a great magazine, and of course, the Midnight Freemasons will be having a section in it, I think starting this month or next month. It could even be two months, but I'll keep you all updated. As you all know, Midnight Freemasons publishes three articles every week of varying topics, always interesting things. We've got some great ones coming up, like I said. While I was in Mid-State, Illinois, I picked up a pin that I hadn't seen before. It was a slipper, and it came with a little story. So I'd like to read that to you right now. It's called The History of the Masonic Slipper, and it's on some cardstock, so you may hear the paper unfolding. The Masonic Slipper. To find the meaning of this pin, let us go back in history to the time of Boaz and the Book of Ruth. Remember that Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons fled to the land of Moab to escape the famine in their homeland of Bethlehem or Judah. Soon, Elimech died. The two sons married Moabite girls, Orpha and Ruth. But the two sons also died, leaving Naomi a widow in a foreign land with two widowed daughter-in-laws. Naomi learned that the famine back home had subsided. She told Orpha and Ruth that she would return home to be with her kinsmen. It was the law that Elimelech's next of kin was duty-bound to redeem his possessions and take care of his widow and her family. She wanted the girls to remain among their own people, but the girls said that they wanted to go with Naomi. Orpha was finally convinced to stay, but Ruth remained firm and went with Naomi. Naomi and Ruth arrived back in Bethlehem, Judah, at harvest time. Naomi was getting old, so Ruth tried to earn a livelihood by gleaning in the fields of Boaz, a kinsman of Naomi. He soon saw her and discovered that she was Naomi's daughter-in-law. He arranged special treatment for her. She could work with his girls in the field, and the young men were not to bother her. Boaz was not married, so Naomi decided to somehow make Boaz understand his duty to Elimelech's family. Naomi advised Ruth to bathe and anoint herself and go to the threshing floor after dark and lay at the feet of Boaz. Boaz awoke and discovered her there. So as not to create a scandal, he gave her some barley and asked her to leave before dawn so that watching eyes would not recognize her. Boaz knew there was a kinsman more closely related to Elimelech than he. As a business among the tribe of Bethlehem Judah took place at the city gate. Boaz sat down at the gate the next day, and when the kinsman came by, Boaz called him aside and asked elders of the city to sit with him. Boaz bargained with the kinsman, and the kinsman said he would claim Elimelech's assets, but when he found out that he would have to also take care of Naomi and Ruth, he rearranged and told Boaz he would not claim or protect Elimelech's property. He would leave it to Boaz. The kinsman took off his shoe and gave it to Boaz as a way of confirming his relinquishment of his claim to Elimelech's property. Boaz held up the shoe for all in the gate to see. He asked them to be witnesses that he became Naomi's protector, Ruth's husband, and redeemer of Elimelech's property. Thus today we have the blue slipper as an emblem of protective influence by masons for their wives, widows, daughters, and other female relatives.
It was the custom of the Freemasons throughout the early 1900s to present their ladies with a small Masonic pin in the shape of a slipper. The slipper pin identified the wearer as the loved one of a Freemason and provided that woman with some degree of protection or consideration. It acknowledges a Master Mason's obligation to protect or assist the female connected with another Freemason. It also provides a means of protection or identification in social or business contacts. So there you have that, and you know, it's pretty cool. You see, I also bought my wife a little heart pin that says Mason's Lady, but I also got her this slipper pin. She really likes them both. Grand Lodge was very, very cool thing to see and to be a part of. What does Grand Lodge have to do with the pin? Well, that's where I got it. To backtrack a little bit, I just want to say that I would probably go every year whether I was an officer or not. It's really worth it for the shopping alone. This is what I'm talking about. As a kid, my mom used to drag me to antique malls and I hated it. Now as an adult, I love them. I like old stuff, stuff with a story, and I really like Masonic stuff. So Masonic antiques are always an intrigue of mine. You can imagine me walking around the same tables looking at all the trinkets and things ten times over, and my wife says I need a sign that says, I heart knickknacks. I won't argue. Before I made my way down to Springfield, I was asked to be on the Grand Lodge Illinois Charities Committee. I accepted. It's not completely official yet. They're working on that stuff. But what does that mean is it means that I can be an official voice to the charities that we do here in Illinois and that I can bring you some awesome stories of how these charities have been used. So starting with this episode, I want to share a story each week about what the Illinois charities have done. But as I read this, I want you guys to remember that your Grand Lodge, no matter what state you're in, has stories like this too. Get involved and help when you can. So let's set the stage for this first great story about Masonic outreach. So there's a brother. He is 65 years old and a Mason who has 37 years of continuous membership. His wife has significant health concerns, including experiencing nine strokes within the past two years. She is very weak and needs assistance from her husband when getting in and out of a chair, a bed, anything. This is a difficult task for him to assist because he has a shoulder injury. Their medical expenses have caused a financial hardship due to their only income being Social Security. Prior to the additional expenses, they were barely getting by on their income. Our outreach services director advocated on their behalf with the local hospital to have their medical bills waived under the charity program. When reviewing their budget for food, they indicated that they only spent $100 a month on food. They frequently eat only one meal per day or a meager meal like toast. Or cereal. Our director searched out local services such as the area food pantry to meet some of their basic needs. However, there still remained the need for perishable items such as meat, milk, vegetables, etc. In some months, they were unable to purchase necessary medications due to lack of funds. Overall, this brother stressed that, quote, we live paycheck to paycheck, if you call it living. Well, I'm happy to report that our Illinois Masonic Outreach Services, in addition to finding them community services, has been providing monthly financial assistance to meet their basic needs. Additionally, a one-time payment of $800 was granted to purchase a lift chair for the brother's wife. How amazing is this? This is the kind of thing the Freemasons do. Yes, we have traditions steeped in esoteric philosophies, but there is also the other great work, the charity. But not the kind that signs a blank check. The kind that gets out there, gets moving, and really helps. Hand to hand, face to face. Again, I am, and you all should be too, so proud to be a part of a fraternity such as ours who does things like this. Now, of course, this is the Illinois Masonic Outreach Program, but other states, like I said, have their programs as well. And remember, they cannot operate without your assistance. For instance, Illinois has 66,000 Masons, each one who pays dues. And of those dues, only $10 goes to the Grand Lodge. For charity. That isn't a lot when you consider the amount of brothers in distress and who could use some assistance. So if you are in Illinois, consider sending a gift. Consider sending a gift to your Grand Lodge in the name of charities in any state you're in, really. And in most places, you can even specify to what charity that you want it to go into. Masonic Children's Home, Children Identification Program, also known as CHIP, whatever you want. If you want to just fund the charities, consider joining the Society of King Solomon, which is a society based on charitable giving here in the state of Illinois. And when I say charitable giving, I mean extraordinary charitable giving. In order to join, you have to give a larger donation 
about $1,000 or more. But before you say, who has that kind of cash? Consider what I did. I gave a good sum from my life insurance policy. It doesn't affect me in the slightest now, and it won't affect my family either, because I've planned for arrangements. But it helps the charities of Grand Lodge operate in day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year operations and expenses. Next, I need to mention the Android, Apple, and Windows 8 apps. It's the same as listening for free everywhere else, but there are two huge differences. First, when you buy the app, you get access to all the papers that we read on the show via PDF. And secondly, you get access to the Masonic wallpapers, which come out every week with the show. We're also on Stitcher Smart Radio. If you're on it too, check us out. If you're not, download it for free, register for free, and use the promo code whence came you at the registration process. And Stitcher Smart Radio sends us $1.00. You support the show, and it costs you nothing. It's very easy to do. If you like healthy living, and who doesn't, consider grabbing some supplements from Onnit Labs who make things like Alpha Brain, which is their flagship product. What is it? It's kind of like vitamins for your brain. I use it a lot of times for circumstances where I need to be very focused, and it works. If you don't think it works or you don't like it, you just tell them when they send you your money back. They don't even want the product. So check them out. If you have a minute, you can check out their links on our website, www.wcypodcast.com. Additionally, if you want to support the show, but you don't want to do any of the things I mentioned, we do also offer a way that you can donate to the show. It's run through PayPal. The link is kind of small. It's on the right-hand side of the page and about halfway to three-quarters of the way down. And being run by PayPal, it's totally secure. Moving on, I got one of the embassy notes in the mail the other week, and there was an area which was pretty neat. And I'd like to read it to you now, and it's called Masonic Explorers Who Left Their Mark. Embassy Notes, Masonic Explorers Who Left Their Mark. Many world-renowned explorers have traveled to new and distant places throughout history, and many of them were Masons. A few took their allegiance even further, leaving Masonic markers in some of the most remote areas of the planet and beyond. A few examples, polar explorer and pioneer aviator Richard Byrd and his pilot, Bernd Balkin, are said to have dropped Masonic flags on both poles. During a 1930s flight over the South Pole, Belchin allegedly added his shrine fez. When astronaut Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr. famously orbited the Earth 22 times, he carried a blue Masonic flag and a Masonic coin with him. He later presented the flag to his lodge in Colorado. Edwin Eugene Buzz Aldrin supposedly brought a Masonic flag to the moon in 1969. Aldrin, a member of Clear Lake Lodge in Texas, is even rumored to have carried a special deputation from the Texas Grand Master claiming the moon as a territorial jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of Texas. And according to an article in Montana, the magazine of Western History, Meriwether Lewis left evidence of his Masonic affiliation in Montana's waterways. The state's modern-day Big Hole River, Ruby River, and Willow Creek were originally named Wisdom, Philanthropy, and Philosophy, names bestowed by Lewis. Quote, in all likelihood, the first Mason to set foot in the region. End quote. Source, California Freemason, October, November, 2011. Okay, next is a piece that I wrote not too long ago for Lodge Education, but I figured I would read it for the show. It will also be on the Midnight Freemasons in a few weeks as well, but here it is a bit early for the listeners. And this piece is called, And Cast No Shadow, by R.H. Johnson, Waukegan Lodge 78, Waukegan, Illinois. What is light? Of course, we may think of it in the basic way. Illuminations making things visible so that we may traverse lands, read, and see the things around us, things that are necessary, and some things which are just captivating, perhaps best described as those things which make us contemplate the glorious works of the creation. The oldest pictograph for that of light is, of course, the sun. It is that which fixes the duration of seasons and years. Light brings us much joy, and not just because it brings a bright and sunny day, we must consider the gifts that the sun brings, crops, a habitable planet, even the gift of good mood. Exposure to the sun increases the body's production of vitamin D, which according to studies promotes a sense of mental well-being, a literal sunny disposition. It is no wonder our ancient ancestors, including some brethren, worshipped the sun. It only made sense. We as Freemasons may see light a different way. We think of it as synonymous with knowledge. To be illuminated is to know something, perhaps to be wise to something which is lost unto the rest, and this is the way of our craft. To illuminate brothers to a new way of living, a new way of seeing, and a new way of hearing. To change direction, but for only a moment, let us consider the space and our degrees in where we are taught the meaning of the circumpunct, the point within the circle. We are told that the point represents a man and the circle. Well, that represents our boundary or our scope of concern. What about other areas in our Masonic system? In many fellow craft lectures, in countless jurisdictions, the point is described and explained in the quote, A point is a figure without dimension. 
If a point is a representation of a man, then a man is without dimension. This is almost insulting. However, let us consider the following. The point represents a man indeed who is without dimension, a mere spot on a piece of paper or indent in the sand or dirt, until, that is, he grows. Now let us look again at the circumpunct, a point or a man surrounded by the circle. But again, what does the circle represent? Perhaps not your boundary, but instead its original meaning, the sun. Now the point within the circle can be described also as a seed, a man surrounded by the light of the sun, the sun having the effect on a man that it has on a seed or on the point. Eventually the seed grows and becomes more than just a point. It becomes a sphere growing exponentially feeding on the light of the sun, or in this case, the knowledge that surrounds him. Now we have come all the way around. The circumpunct, a point within a circle, a seed surrounded by the sun, a man surrounded by the light of knowledge. When the point in the center becomes so big that it lapses equally around the circle, the man, or you, now becomes the light. It then becomes your duty to be that light which shines on the seedlings, or new brothers, you must shine bright. Be there to comfort, to guide, and to nourish the new brother's growth. Let that light, let your light be so bright that you illuminate all things, and from you, let no shadow be cast. All right, so I, I hope you enjoyed that piece. Again, I originally authored that piece for just Lodge Education, but it's going to eventually go up on the Midnight Freemasons as well. And so now it's time for this week's famous Freemason. I'm often asked why I don't cover guys like George Washington or any of the U.S. presidents, and I'm also constantly receiving emails as to how much people enjoy hearing about famous men who weren't as famous as some others. Why is this? Well, it's two sides of the same coin. You all know about Washington. And you all know about Franklin, so why wouldn't I read about an obscure but famous in their own right Freemason? This week is no different. Before this week, I hadn't heard of this gent, but now I know about him, and so will you. John McDowell Stewart, surveyor, explorer, born in 1815, passed away in 1866. Now this information was actually pulled directly from johnmcdowellstewart.org.au perpetuating the names and achievements of the great Australian explorer and his companions. So these guys have compiled quite a bit of history on this gentleman, and I'd like to read a little bit just from their website. William Hardman, editor of the Journal of John McDougall Stewart, first published in 1864 by Saunders, Oatley & Company, London, wrote, quote, The explorations of Mr. John McDougall Stewart may truly be said without disparaging his brother's explorers to be in amongst the most important in the history of Australian discovery. The Adelaide Masonic Center, North TCE Adelaide, is the home of the Stewart Collection. The John McDowell Stewart Society has a strong relationship with Freemasonry in South Australia. John McDowell Stewart was initiated into the Lodge of Truth, number 933 EC, North Adelaide, on the 1st of August in 1859. Stewart claimed he recognized a Masonic greeting when he encountered a party of traditional owners in Northern Australia. The McDowell Stewart Lodge No. 219 in Alice Springs is named in his honor. T.G.H. Stralo, reader in Australian Linguistics, University of Adelaide, 1967, wrote, In Stewart, Australia, possessed a man cast in the mold of a hero, a man whose amazing persistence, indomitable courage, and unfailing common sense enabled him to succeed in a mighty task in which most others would have failed. This brief summary of his life and achievements is presented by the John McDowell Stewart Society to promulgate an important chapter in Australian history when a wee Scott unlocked Australia's center and blazed a south to north route across the continent. The John McDowell Stewart Society acknowledges Mona Stewart Webster, who in 1958 published the first full-length biography of her great-granduncle. Her book, John McDowell Stewart, is the main reference used in this summary. Among the 73 passengers aboard the 422-ton barge which sailed on her maiden voyage from Dundee, Scotland on September 13, 1838, were two young Scots who would form a lifelong friendship in the new colony of South Australia. James Sinclair from the Isle of Arran was destined to be a pioneer pastoralist and John McDowell Stewart would rise from obscurity to be acclaimed as Australia's greatest inland explorer, but would leave the colony with its constitution thoroughly broken down and nearly blind. A forgotten hero. John, aged 23, was described by a fellow passenger as somewhat delicate, having two rather severe attacks of vomiting blood. He was of small stature, standing 5 foot 6 inches, and weighing less than 9 stone. 
hardly the description of a man destined for hero status. Had he possessed a more imposing physique, he may well have followed in the family tradition of an officer in the British Army. John was the youngest son of nine children. Three died in infancy. Born to William and Mary Stewart on September 7, 1815, William, an ex-army captain, moved his family to Dysart, where he was appointed as customs officer. Dysart, a once important commercial port, stands on the northern shore of the Firth of Forth, almost directly opposite Edinburgh. The family resided in possibly the oldest remaining 16th century house on the corner of Fitzroy Place, formerly the Colgate, and Rectory Lane. It was here that John was born, and today it houses a museum in his honor. Both parents died when John was in his early teens, and he and his brothers and sisters were cared for by relatives and friends. John attended the Scottish Naval and Military Academy and graduated as a civil engineer. The recorded reasons for his decision to immigrate are interesting, but are not included in the text. Stewart arrived in South Australia on January 21, 1839. Adelaide was then a rough settlement just over two years old. A collection of tents and wooden huts with earth floors and thatched roofs. Thick scrubs still covered much of the surveyed area and the majority of the colony's population congregated on the site of the city. This isolated colony on the shore of Gulf Street, Vincent was the result of years of work and planting by systematic colonizers, a group of people in England led by Edward Gibbon Wakefield. At the time of Stewart's arrival, the local administration of the colony was in turmoil. The surveyor general, Colonel William Light, who selected the site and surveyed Adelaide, had resigned and would-be landowners were demanding that surveys of the land be completed. Stewart obtained work possibly as a draftsman on the survey staff, where resources were stretched to the limit, endeavoring to meet the demands of officials and settlers in the new colony. Life in the survey camps was rough, and Stewart soon learned to recognize the signs and symptoms of scurvy, the disease which devastated him in later years. Captain Charles Stewart was appointed Surveyor General in early 1839 and re-established the Survey Department, making conditions and equipment more adequate for his men. In 1842, Stewart was retrenched, possibly due to the government downsizing. He then worked privately as a surveyor and was involved in sheep farming with his shipmate, James Sinclair, at Nairn in the Mount Lofty Ranges. It is likely he kept in touch with Sturt because in 1844, he was engaged as a draftsman on Sturt's expedition into the interior of Australia. Sturt was hoping to, quote, unfold the secrets of the interior and plant the ensign of our country in the center of this mysterious land. This epic journey which saw Sturt reach a point closer to the center of the continent than any other recorded European was Sturt's final expedition, but Stuart gained valuable experience. Following the death of James Poole, Sturt's second in command, from scurvy, Stuart was appointed assistant to Sturt. The expedition failed to achieve its main objectives being repelled by the harshness of Sturt's stony desert and the waterless wastes of the Simpson Desert. To Sturt, the interior of Australia was alien, hostile, malign, almost terrifying. But to Stuart, the inland was wonder-inspiring, enthralling. He admired the stupendous works of nature. Both Sturt and Stuart suffered from the effects of scurvy, and on their return to Adelaide, Stuart recorded that he lost the power of his limbs and was laid up for 12 months. Sturt recorded the valuable and cheerful assistance he received from Stuart and commended him for his labor on the charts. Stuart continued to work as a private surveyor, but his experiences with Sturt had influenced his life and he became restless. He preferred the bush environment and was advised by his doctor to reside in the country for the benefit of his health. He moved to Port Lincoln possibly in 1846 and was involved in private surveys. In 1848, he joined the household of James Sinclair, who had moved into the district. By the day, he was employed as a shepherd and at night gave lessons to Sinclair's children, their only schooling. In the early 1850s, Stewart left the employment of James Sinclair and accompanied William Fink to the northern Flinders Ranges, a region then largely unexplored. He was engaged to survey pastoral leases, explore, and protect and prospect for minerals, an offer he could not resist. This association with Fink and his business partners, James and John Chambers, changed the course of Stewart's life. In 1866, Stewart passed away at age 50 on the 5th of June and was buried at the nearby Kensal Green Cemetery. Things that his expeditions accomplished was, principally as a result of Stewart's expeditions, the riddle of the geographical nature of the center of Australia was solved. The western border of South Australia was moved from the 132nd degree east longitude to the 129th degree east longitude. 
Control of the Northern Territory was transferred to the South Australia. The overland telegraph line linking Adelaide to the world via Darwin was constructed along his route. The original Central Australia Railway from Adelaide to Alice Springs followed a similar route. South Australia established a settlement on the north coast at Darwin and vast areas of the north were opened up for pastoral and mineral development. Today his name is perpetuated by the Stuart Highway linking Adelaide to Darwin, geographical features named in his honor, his statue in Victoria Square, Adelaide, where an annual remembrance ceremony is held, memorials and plaques throughout South Australia and the Northern Territory. The John McDool Stewart Collection housed at the Adelaide Masonic Center 254 North Terrace, Adelaide. The John McDool Stewart Museum in Dysart, Kirkcaldy, Scotland is open Thursday through Sunday, 1 to 5 p.m. The existence of the John McDool Stewart Society was also incorporated. That's it for this week. Please find us on Facebook and follow on Twitter. Check out the Midnight Freemasons three times a week for great articles. Follow Juan Sepulveda of the Winding Stairs podcast on Twitter at WindingStairs33. Follow Rob Lewis from the Far From Centered podcast at FFC. Check out the Masonic businesses like PB&J Water, purifying water with American-made parts for entire counties. It's run by Brother Jeff Koch. Check out our Brother to the North at Fraternal Ties, bringing you Masonic neckwear that really looks classy. Check out the bookstore featuring books by friends and guests of the show right on our website, www.wcypodcast.com. Show your support for Joseph James's new film, The Freemason, starring Sean Astin. Be ready for upcoming interviews. Upcoming interviews will be Lynn Abrams, a Freemason who can tell you what you're doing wrong when you're shaving, and Mike Shirley, a brother who works with the Grand Lodge leadership staff who can tell you how to be a great leader. Those will be forthcoming in the next few weeks. Take care, everybody and stay on the level for whence came you. I'm Robert Johnson.